Okay, now we are back from our coffee. So it's time to go back and testing. We sign with, with the unit tester. We started seeing it before the break, and now okay. we'll go on deeper and deeper. Okay. Yes. Oh, broader and broader maybe because I have, you know when you do a training like this one when it's an introduction and I, you don't know in advance about the level of the people you have two choices either you go very deep in one topic or you try to be broad. I chose um, the second option because there are a lot of very deep uh, training for for example there's one about uh, TDD with selenium which is very deep on one topic. I, I, I'm trying to give you the whole landscape uh, so I hope you will find some tool you like and use it because the, you know the key point is that every kind of testing is better than no testing. So now we will uh, continue with the unit test and uh, uh, there are a, lo a lot of asserts options. Uh, we can assert, for example, uh, uh, if, if, if we see the, the factorial or factorial example, um, we did uh, we did check that a, a specific exception was raised in some situation. There is an, an assert for. Uh, for that, which is, I won't be doing the, the whole example again because mm, I'd like to talk about something else, but is self assert mm, raises exception and uh, exception. exception. Again, I don't want to go into much details because I think this is the uh, yes, but it, it wouldn't work anyway. I just mm, just. Mm, wanted to show you the name of the method. Uh, the best thing in this case is just browse mm, the Python library documentation. Uh, oh, uh, someone. You know, in the past, I, I always made sure to have a library that or either a PDF or HTML. Nowadays, you have Google, so you don't really need anything else. So if you write Python, you need tests uh, when you have network, not like right now. Okay. You'll just find the docs and you'll see there are a lot of different uh, asserts. Assert equal, assert not equal, assert true, false, is is not. Um, I, we won't cover all of these because, you know, conceptually they're all the same. I just want to, to say you about a very cool one that is assert almost equal and almost not equal. Uh, do you remember when we talked about the floating point problem? Um, it's very useful for that because if you say assert equal to uh, point three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're not sure that we will be really be equal on every machine. Here you can say how many decimal places you want to consider, or a delta, so it can be equal plus or minus zero point, which is very convenient. And I'm just showing you this because it's something that uh, will happen if you work with floating points. So, uh, you can assert regular expression matching and so on and so forth. But I think um, for now, uh, we, 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 what we can say about unit tests is mm, the main problem is what is a unit. A unit of code is an independent piece of code, so uh, you should not have, and we'll see how to solve that problem, uh, a unit that depends, a unit test that depends on another unit test. Uh, first of all, it probably won't work because of the way they are called, because they are not called in the order you define, but in alphabetical order. And then you're not doing unit testing, because unit testing is the kind of test, well, you want to be really sure that that specific behavior works well. If you're calling other methods and uh, you're relying on what happens before, maybe there's a masked bug. So uh, your goal in the unit testing is to define what your units are, think about behavior, not methods or functions, and test them singularly in isolation. 
test must be atomic. And uh, yes, we, we have, uh, I've shown you test classes, uh, which are test cases, which collect a, a bunch of, of uh, tests together. There are suites as well that collect test cases or singular tests. We won't be seeing that much because I'll show you a much better method to, to collect uh, and, and, do, and find tests in your code. And um, we've seen, actually before we, we got into unit tests, uh, just a, a bit of taste of test-driven programming, uh, which is, I, I really like it, how it just sort of emerged from, from the discussion, because um, test-driven programming just, there's a lot of philosophy and methodology, but just in, the, in a nutshell is starting to test before you start to code. Uh, one thing that uh, that this test driven program is very good for is when you have a coder block you know what the problem is but you don't know how to start so you just start mm, uh, writing the tests uh, and, and the API will sort of, of, of form itself and another good very very good thing is be, is it removes a barrier between the change of code because uh, maybe you have implemented something that works but is really slow or it doesn't work as well as it should. You, you'd like to change something but you, of course, you, 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 have, you are afraid of so-called regressions. That means the facts then just come up when you change something. If you have a good unit test suite, you can just uh, launch it every time you do some change and you'll be sure that uh, you, you'll, you'll find that it still works like it should. So as I said before, test-driven programming is very good for your mind for your, in a psychological, psychological way because it mm, helps you to achieve some trust in your code and in your changes. And, um, uh, okay, so now it's something um, that uh, a lot of you will ha yes could you elaborate on the test behaviors you got test behaviors not methods yes for instance uh, yes yes i i will elaborate on that a bit actually it's something we have seen uh, right in the beginning when we test our factorial okay the factorial is a single function so if we if we think as a unit as a function we should have a single test. But in fact, we wrote many, even doc tests. Uh, so for example, we want to test that the factorial of a negative number raises an exception. This is a behavior. Uh, you want to test that the factorial of, of zero is one. We want to test it because it's a boundary. So it's where we uh, often do bugs because we, we, we use uh, greater than instead of greater or equal. And so that boundary test is another behavior we want to test in the same function. It's, uh, you know, it's orthogonal sort. Uh, you, you, in some cases, you, they will map nicely, especially if you, when you're doing object-oriented programming, sometimes the methods have a single behavior. They should in general, but not always. Sometimes you could have the other way around. Uh, you could have more than one method or function or unit of, of code uh, that implements a single behavior. It's not as easy as I, as I make it sound. That, this is a, a, a very, very hard problem. Uh, figuring out in, in non-trivial uh, cases what a unit, what a be single behavior really is. But it's not a function, not a method. It's uh, th something that you want to happen in a certain way. So, for example, in the factorial example, we, we, we found Savera. Okay? Okay. So, yes, yeah, something that a lot of people has asked me during the coffee break is, uh, I, okay, I, I do get doc tests, I do get unit tests, but in the practice, when we start having a big project with a lot of tests, it, it, it usually ends up in a mess because I have a test, a textual doc test in, in a file, doc strings, uh, maybe a couple of unit tests. Um, I didn't show you here, we, we did something that is not very uh, convenient. We have the test in the same file 
as, as the code, but of course what we do usually, for example, if you want to test this factorial, we do another file. Uh, the custom is to call, is to name is uh, test factorial. We just use the test, we import unit test, and we import factorial as well. Or even from factorial. Uh, so we have the code file without the test on his own, which usually is the right way to do because we want some separation between things. Uh, for instance, we could decide to totally change the implementation, change the, me the uh, and we don't want the test to be to be lost, so we do another separate file, which usually is named test underscore name of the module we are testing. We import it, and we do the test like this: def test uh, zero self. Now, let's do this. and so on and so forth. Is, is this uh, clear for everyone? We're just moving it on another file. Uh, except we are... Okay. Okay. This is the, the normal way of doing it, having the test separated from the module they're testing. In, in very simple project, you could have a single test file that tests a lot of modules, uh, you can do as many as many classes and uh, as you want. It's, it's just uh, here as um, in other cases just how you want to organize it. You can put it in a single file, everything, which is not usually a good idea on separate. But anyway, in non-trivial project, you will end, ha end up having a lot of test cases, a lot of test files, both doc tests and unit tests. And how do we find them? Uh, with unit tests, uh, it, it's a bit better now in, in from Python 2.7 onwards because it has some test discovery machinery, which wasn't there before. But in any case, it's not very convenient when you have doc test 2. And fortunately, there's a tool which is called Nose. Uh, you should be able to in my machine is it's already installed, of course. A Nose does a lot of things uh, for testing, but we'll just see uh, a single a single one uh, that it it's testing auto discovery. It comes with a um, command, uh, nose tests, which just collects every test it finds. By default, it collects every test that it finds from the current directory uh, deep into, uh, into our uh, directory tree. So here we have um, uh, three files. Uh, some some tests failed because uh, there is an error because I didn't complete the code. Some tests uh, uh, some tests are, uh, can be errors. If you go in this directory, it will find uh, no tests. No 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 tests. it will find even more. Uh, usually it works with just a reg uh, regular expression matching. It uh, just matches everything that starts with tests. So, and if you want to test doc tests as well, it's very simple. Uh, the, so, you just collected doc tests as well. It's, it's that simple. If you want to collect doc tests, not in doc strings, but in separate text files, uh, 
I think, is doctor suspension. I never, I can never remember the options of anything. Yes. It's Okay, so it's very simple. It's uh, it will just you you can do a lot of things. You can exclude certain paths. You can exclude certain regular expression and so on and so forth. Uh, we won't cover it because we we don't have time. But in just using it as it is is a great way not to 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 you know not to care about where those my tests are. They just have to be there, named test something that uh, knows will will keep care of launching them. Another question uh, that I've heard during the coffee break is m more about testing. Uh, it's all easy and dandy when you're just doing stuff with trivial examples, but in real world, applications are complex. We use databases. We have functions that call other functions. Uh, things are not that easy to test in isolations, in isolation where you, you are relying on an external database and um, tests will surely become very slow and tests must never be slow because unit tests are supposed to be called as often as possible. Uh, you do a couple of changes, just launch unit test. You go to coffee break and return, launch unit test. You want to, really, it's, it's really uh, it just give you your rhythm by your, so if they're slow, by slow I mean at most one minute, one minute is, is really slow for a Python world, uh, they won't be effective. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why having dependencies is not good. Mm, but the speed is only one. We, we already said that the unit test must be isolated. If we, we were using an external database, we're not, we, we can't be sure if that if a test is failed. Is it MySQL? Is it Postgres? Is it Mongo? Or is, is my code? So we must have ways to uh, factor out those dependencies. And another thing is there are certain things that are not very easy to, to, to test. For example, let's do a function. No, let's do a class. Can be the init. Okay, how do we test this? Time time dot time is going to be different every time we, we call it. Uh, it's, we, we can't do a test uh, uh, saying assert equal. So how can we be sure that uh, the, val the value that's stored here is the, the, ac the actual one, the right one? Of course, there is a trivial matter, but uh, when date, dates calculations are involved, uh, things must always be, be tested because date calculation are usually the, the, the most tricky thing in programming, or one of the most tricky things. And uh, we can we have to find a way. Same is if we had to connect to a database and we want to factor it out. Well, uh, in unit test, there's a, um, a way to do this that is called mocking. Mocking as in imitating. So we just do an object that behaves uh, pretty much the same way the object we want to exclude, to factor out, that can be a database or in this case time.time. .time. And uh, we just use it instead of the actual object. Um, the best thing is if we can use it right in the test without the actual code knowing it, because we can't just do if, debug, then type. We could do it manually because Python is very dynamic and you can patch things, but it's not very convenient. So um, there are a lot of mocking uh, 
libraries. In Python, I will use Mocker, which you can get like this. OK, most mocking libraries work in uh, um, what is called um, record replay paradigm. It means you just, OK, so from mocker, import mocker. No. Uh, is more. I can never remember the mocker dot mocker. Okay. I can never remember st stuff in libraries because I, I use these and I use mock that is quite different. So okay, import mocker. Sorry? Uh, no, I usually use Mocker or Mock, which is being included in Python 3.3, but it has uh, another, another way of working. It's not true story play, it's uh, with assertions. I think this is uh, much easier to, to understand. OK, now I got the API right. So we have to instantiate. This that will be uh, no. Okay, it's a bit tricky because we have two things: a mocker that is mm, fundamentally a singleton, that is this one, and an ob an ob another object that is the mock object itself. So uh, I always get it wrong because I I get it wrong with mock and uh, which which is a bit different. So uh, I, I have notes for for that. And just remember there are two things: the mocker singleton and the object we are trying to mocking. So okay, import mocker. Mock is a mocker, and we start doing a mock object. So we say record replay. We are in record mode here. Okay. <sighs> yeah, I call it mock. Sorry about that. Okay, so we called a method on the object that will be our actual mock, not that the method didn't exist before. Uh, if you want, I can start again because I, got, I made a mess with names and maybe some of you are confused at this point. OK, so we import the library. We create the mocker singleton. The mocker will uh, we will just give it comments to to say okay now start replaying what I did. But what we want, what we will use is not these, but it's another object that will be the actual mock. This mock is just an orchestrator of things. Okay. We could as well say mocker equals to mocker dot mocker. Uh, we will just shadow the library name, but it will be okay because this is all we need. So, okay, so we say we want a mock. Let's get one from the mocker. Uh, we want it to answer to this method. Hello. Okay, now we, we are recording. Uh, we are saying, okay, when we launch, launch this method, we want a certain result. And we have to do this in the mocker. OK, 
Okay? Okay, now we have recorded a behavior. It's very simple. We just do what we want to do later. Let's uh, register another. Okay. Sorry? Oh, sorry, yes. Okay. Okay, now we give it mock uh, replay, which means, okay, we've, we've done recording. Now we're going to use, use that object. So it was obj. We define the two methods, hello and bye. He just did what we what we, we told him to do. We could have any kind of behavior. This is the other method we tested. Okay. And this is quite interesting. It just recorded the number of times we just we called hello and bye. We called hello and bye one exactly one time. So if it, it is called two times, it says, hey, that's what, not what uh, was supposed to, ha to happen. And it throws an assertion error, which can be very good to test um, what's arriving, for example, to a database. If uh, the database received two connect strings, something's wrong. There are options to, 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 to avoid this. Uh, there are options to make sure the methods are called in a specific order. We, um, for example, always hello, then buy. Um, it's, it just have some cool context manager, which is with mock uh, order, and then we define them here. But again, I don't want to, to, to go into details, but uh, I want to... Sh there are a lot of things then that mocker can do. Uh, if you want to go back, uh, we just do restore and we delete the, the programming we did on, on the Mocha. Uh, Mocha can do a lot of things, can do, uh, for example, uh, so-called proxying, uh, which means it can intercept call, calls to an actual instance of a class. You just do this. When you instantiate the object that will be the mocker, you pass it the, either the class of an instance to the class. Let's try what we did before. Um, result. Oh, did you see what happened there? We just did everything like before, except we passed an actual class. This is called auto-spec. Uh, usually, when we want to mock an object, we want to mock a, a class or that really exists. So uh, we sh we, 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 it's nice to be sure that we are not calling methods that don't exist in the database. If someone is calling the hello method on or Postgres connection, that is an error. And so this is very cool because if we po pass the, the class to the when we create the mocker, he will check that every uh, method that gets called actually exists in the real class. So yes, I did record the object hello, but it doesn't uh, exist in the re in my class. This is very cool and very useful because because mocking are uh, very dangerous for this. Mm. You can often do something, uh, mock an object, then the, the actual object uh, changes, but the mocker keep accepting the old output. 
if you tie it with, with a real with a real class it uh, it will always check you for that for you there are more sophisticated things uh, like proxying <laughs> you can uh, uh, take it an instance of a class and say okay i want to intercept uh, connect uh, but not car so i want to intercept the function f but uh, uh, I'll just uh, execute the real uh, function G. Uh, there is just a, a, a method that is um, passed through that you'll call and it will work that way. There is patching. Patching is the other way around. Instead of creating an, an object mock, uh, an, another object that you will lose instead of an instance of the real class, uh, you will just patch the class with mocking where it's uh, is needed and uh, mm, there is replace that is very very cool and it does exactly what exactly what we need for time dot time let's see it in action so okay let's just see it and uh, so Okay, so there is a function that is not very easy to test because time dot time will change every time. Pound was not intended, and it's not very easy to write a test for this. But Okay, we are instantiating our mock and we're saying this mock object will replace from now on this name, time dot time. And when it gets called, we want to have some specific time, for instance uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, not mocker, sorry. It's called mock. We just did what we did before. We call the method and then, and then we say the result. But uh, this time we say that in advance we are going to replace that name. So let's uh, see if it works. Uh. Oh, sorry, I, I just... Uh, I just got it. Let's do it again. Uh, okay, it is calling our mock. Uh, I I have uh, done something wrong before, but you can see it's it's not calling the original time dot time. It's calling our mock. Let's try it again. Okay. I'm sorry about those mistakes, but mm, they just show you that mm, getting stuff right on first time, even if you know what you're talking about, is can be always a mess. Import time. Oh, yes, yeah, we don't need arguments. It's not a very useful function, you know, but... Okay, 
This is cool because we didn't have to change the actual code at all. The function f doesn't know what's happening. For all that it knows, it's calling time dot time. We just replace it time dot time under on the receipt. Uh, that's very cool. That's a very, very useful feature of uh, the mocker library. You can replace every kind of name. Uh, you, you will usually do it in your unit tests. So you report your code. You can change uh, time to time. You can change uh, SQLite, everything that would make it not isolated or not feasible to test. And again, there are a lot of options, but uh, I, th I think we've seen that the most useful one that is the rest uh, rec record replay uh, paradigm, the proxying and auto spacing. That means attaching it to a class, and it ensures that all calls will always be calls possible in the actual class. And the replace that I, I think is maybe the single most useful feature of Mocker. Sorry if again for the mistakes or the imports and whatnot. Just remember you have a mock object that we will take replay and this kind of comments and an object that will be the, the, the actual mock you're doing could be database, DB or so on and so forth. Yes? I got the same error you got before. Yes, because it, 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 I, I think I have called uh, time dot time, two times in some way, because it, um, as I said, by default, it ensures that everything gets called uh, exactly the same number of times. So if you, by miss, for example, if I now do this, it gives me the same error because I just when I was in in record mode, I just call it one time, exactly one time. So it, it checks it and it's good that it does because usually you want to be sure that there's exactly one database connection. It's one more test it's doing for it. Again, there are a lot of options, a lot of ways of altering its behavior, of saying I don't care about the order, I do care about the order, but we won't see it uh, here. What do you think about mocking? Yeah. Yes, it, by default it does. You can, you can, you can say it, it can be called multiple uh, number of times, but usually in tests you just, uh, you want to be sure that it's called the right number of times. So you could just do it two times at a time. Because if a library is called more times than it should, then something else is wrong. But again, there are a lot of options to mocker. I don't want to go into detail. I just hope you uh, you find the concept useful and you, you, you understood why, why. I think it's, it's very cool. And uh, in Python 3.3 has again a different uh, library that unfortunately is quite similarly named. It's called Mock. And as you have seen, I tend to mess the two things around. But it, I decided to, to show you Mocker because it's a, a bit more easy the paradigm of uh, replay, restore, you just, it's just like, mm, you know, doing a video of, uh, of what you want to happen and then playing it again until it really happens. Yes? So I don't quite understand yeah. how you would, would you use this together with doc tests or unit tests? Uh, yes, we can, we, can, we can do an example if you want. Let's say uh, we have a class that for some reason uh, stores, um, stores the current time when it's created. Maybe we are just uh, uh, writing a log and we want a timestamp. This will be very hard to test because what value should be? We have to test that the, the actual time is stored. Uh, but how do we test it? We don't know in advance what the value will be, so we can't just do something like this. Uh, test dot test case. 
uh, def. Oh, uh, this gives me the occasion to, to, to talk about something I forgot before, which is fixtures. Uh, oftentimes, you will have to prepare some data before you launch test cases. For instance, we, we have a class here, and uh, if we have to, to, to test multiple behaviors and multiple method calls to the class, we have to instantiate it in some way. And, of course, we could do this, in every single test, but that wouldn't be very convenient, and we would repeat our code, and if we change, for instance, the signature, we will have to change it in maybe a dozen of tests. So uh, a cool thing of, uh, a cool method of test cases is set up uh, things you do here are uh, the setup is just called before every single test. We'll just mm, say pass here because we don't want to, to spend more time. And there's another teardown. So what happens is when you launch uh, unit test main, setup gets called, then test time is right, then teardown. Then if you, we have another test, setup is called again, then the other test, then tear down. So is set up, test, tear down, set up, test, tear down for every single test, which is very useful because you don't want, again, a subsequent test to use. Maybe, maybe we, we, we are testing a behavior of, I don't know, a library for uh, having a collection of books. We created a few books in the test before and we will find them there. So we just have to recreate the instance every time because we don't want state to, to persist from test to test. And set up and tear down is a good way to, to do this because they will be get called before set up and after every single test. But let's return to your question, sorry. Uh, okay, here we want to make sure that self-created is really equal to time dot time. How do we do? We just can do We can do this because time dot time here will be different than at creation time here. No self dot time. It's just time. Ah, sorry. Time yes, I didn't. I didn't write. It. I I was about to write it in setup, but I didn't. Uh, do you understand what's the problem here? Yeah. Okay. So what we can do here is use mocker to mock time dot time in the subsequent call. So we do what we did before. Uh, okay, we can import here, it's the same. Import mocker, and then mock. Okay, and mock replay. So we can be sure that after mock replay, the call to time dot time will always give back one to three. So this solves a problem because we, if the method is is we, we we created a deterministic version of time dot time, we always know. So that is a, a and the actual way it can be used with, with within your unit tests. You can do it in doc tests as well. Uh, actually, doc tests are not very good for this kind of thing because, uh, you know, they wouldn't be very good documentation because there would be a lot of boilerplate code for mock 
which is good, which is okay in your unit test because you're not going to, to show them to your users. So this is one reason for using both. Is it clear now? Yeah. Okay, for everyone? How cool is the I love mocker? It's very, very cool. The, the ability of patching things on the go, of just saying from now on, time dot time is, is fantastic. And it, it's very easy to do in Python because of the introspection you, you have at object level, so it can patch things around uh, even at runtime. Yes? How can you stop the uh, mocker behavior? So how can you uh, how can you get the uh, time to time function back to what you? Well, in this case, it just it just uh, gets stopped. Uh, uh, ju either you call mock dot restore, or in this case, it just uh, works for one call, as we we've, we've seen before. But we we would have a, a, we would have an assertion error the second. So we just call mock dot restore. Yes, as soon as, as, soon as the, the function yes. ends, the mock of object course. is garbage collected. So yes, yes. Just, just uh, or we can put it in setup and turn down. If, you, if we need a mocker for every single test, the same mocker we can do in this way as well. It's, yes, if it is garbage collected, I mean, if you mean outside this function, there's no problem because it's just a, it's just a normal Python object when the function, this method, uh, life cycle ends, it just get garbage collector. Or you can manually call mock restore. Depends depends on, on, on your situation. So okay. How much time do we have? How much time do we have? One hour? Uh, an hour. An hour. Okay. So uh, after seeing uh, a bit of stuff that works code, I I want to throw some philosophy again at you, but I, I actually promised this in, in, in the train description because it's a, a real problem that I've seen uh, in organization. Mm, meaning uh, you as a programmer are finally convinced that uh, doing structure testing is, is a good idea, but your boss is not because uh, it is a cost, you know. Uh, if you spend one hour of time coding, it's okay, but if you spend one hour of time coding plus one hour of time testing, you're just wasting 50%, right? And uh, I don't know if that happened to you, it happened a lot of time to me, even in a large organization, and it can be uh, very difficult to, 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 you know, to explain your technical reasons. Uh, so I'll just show you a kind of argument that uh, administrative person can, can usually understand. It usually works. So this is actual data from IBM research, but you can find a lot of data that is um, similar. This is an actual figure. I'm not, I'm not making it out. The cost of solving a defect grows exponentially with time, which is, of course, which is clear to us programmers, if you find a bug just 10 minutes after coding a module, you will have everything in your memory. You will, you will probably remember where to look. Uh, and at the beginning, the module will be, anyway, very small. One month from now, you won't remember where to look, and maybe you will have 40 more modules, 30 more modules or function to look at. So it, goes, it, it just goes with experience. But 10,000 times per cent is a lot. And the bugs, uh, the facts we, which you didn't find at first, will be there anyway. So actually, when you decide skip, to skip testing because you don't have time, you're not making a sound technical or administrative decision because you will have to spend the time anyway later, but multiplied by 100 or more. So it's just a kind of terrible financial decision. Is is as a loan you're asking yourself uh, to give back that time you you, you just saved, uh, so that money you just saved, one hundred more. It's one kind of a loan that could get you arrested if you do did this to someone else. You're just lending time to yourself at a terrible rate. 
this is usually a type of argument that management can understand and is backed by lots, lots of, of actual data of, of big and small sort of problems. So I can confirm it uh, from my experience. I'm more than a management guy than a, a Python guy for now. I, <laughs> I'm moving toward a Python guy. And uh, I was in a project where they decided uh, not to fix bugs earlier. And uh, six months uh, after that, it became a pay an incredible pain. They were considering of redoing everything from scratch because uh, they didn't yeah. do enough It can be that costly because, of they, course... They mixed analysis and testing. Yeah. It was... Uh, Hopefully. Of course, it can be even worse if, if, you, if you find them, if your users find them, it will be a mess because the cost will skyrocket because you, you, you can't just, you can't even say I will do it from scratch. You'll have uh, terrible feedback from your users then maybe won't buy your products anymore, Windows 95 anyone. <laughs> and, and so it will be a mess. So if you put it in this way, okay, you don't want to spend $10 now to fix bugs, you're going to spend $1,000 in a month. It should be easy enough to understand, and, uh, which is, by the way, uh, the reason because nowadays you tend not to do waterfall uh, kind of development. First you do all the design, then you do all the coding, then you cry because nothing works and it's late. Nowadays, you tend to do to iterate. We do a bit of design, a bit of coding, a bit of testing, then a bit more, a bit more, and we build, we will, we, but we have uh, fixed more stuff, hopefully, uh, soon enough. Okay. So, okay, the, um, another question that I've heard is uh, about, uh, yes, okay, unit tests are cool, but in the end, when I have a big application, uh, how do I test it? Because, you know, integration testing is what's called testing the whole application with database, with, with, with files, and with external system, uh, maybe with web services and all. And you must test it because unit tests won't, will help you a lot, but when you take all units, and try to make everything work the first time, nothing will work. Of course, um, doing it without even having unit testing will be worse because not even single unit will work by themselves or you don't know. And I, I, we don't have time to cover integration tests very much because it, it would require at least in the same time just for that. But just some general concept is that they are quite the, the opposite of unit tests. Unit tests, you just want to test each unit in isolation. In integration tests, you usually want to go as near as to the end user experience as possible. So you must have your uh, database on, you must, if your application has a web interface, you will be using that because a bug there, anyway, it b will be a bug for the user. And so what I, you just have to write other test suites. Of course, you can use unit tests and doc tests. The fact it's called unit test doesn't mean it can be used for integration testing. But what I strongly suggest to you here is not to try to do just one test fits for all. For example, you usually won't be using much mockers in integration testing because you want to see if the actual connection database works. Maybe it, it works on, on the paper, but it's too slow and you get a timeout. So you just have to, to do integration testing, you can use the same tools. There are um, a few cool tools that, that you can use specifically for integration testing. And um, I, will, I will show one of them, which is called Twill. It's a simple language to, to, to drive web applications from a script. Very quickly, because I want to get into fuzzing, which is very cool, in my opinion. So Twill, uh, again, you can install it with When you do, you will find, you should find, hopefully, <laughs> this command in your system. 
Uh, it's just uh, it's just a, a shell, pretty much like Python shell, but it only has to greater than size. That allows you to drive the web uh, with commands. Mm. I think I'm, I'm having some network problem. No network with internet connection. Yeah. Do you have a network connection? Yeah. Just me there. Um, okay, we'll do like this. Uh, we'll do into into fuzzing first, which is okay. It's, it's, uh, it's okay. We'll do okay. we'll do uh, maybe it's. it's do you want to try an I don't. I, I think oh, might be something on my system. Let's try it again. Okay, okay. it was just a cable that was so. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of commands like uh, we can see forms. We can do a lot of things programmatically. Uh, let's keep it uh, sorry. Let's keep it simple. We'll just test. Uh, uh, let's go to the EuroPython site, which is much cooler. Okay. Okay, one thing you can do is assert uh, everything went well. I don't know if you if you know about HTTP codes. You will surely know about 404, which happens when it doesn't find a page. When the page is found and everything is correct, it's called 200. Okay. If I say, for example, uh, code 404, it says no, I received the 200 from HTTP server. So you can you can start to see that. It's very easy to, to test, for example, if pages are going well, just doing a, a Twitter script. Then we can follow links. Cool, the ground space ex exists. <coughs> ah, here. Okay, we here we are going to a page that I don't think it exists, and we could find this programmatically because the code is is not what we would expect. If okay, I'm going a bit quick because I don't want to spend a lot of time on Twill. But if uh, something is not clear, please stop me. Uh, yeah. Is Twill available to be imported in Python? Yes, there are three ways to use Twill. This is one, just from the from the shell. The second thing you can do, quite easily, is oh, it was already done. You can just write a bunch of of uh, of Twill commands. And it, it also has a nice option to specify the URL uh, from, the, from the command line, which is cool when you have to test a bunch of pages. So, twill, sage, okay, succeeded. But if you try, try it with, uh, I don't know, google.com, unless they have put a grants page here there somewhere, it will fail, which is very cool. But if we want to, to call it from Python, uh, it has an API, which is 
quite different from the comments. You have a get browse. It's a Pythonic API. I won't cover it there. But the most, maybe the most simple, simple way is just from twill pass import execute file. And you can just uh, call execute, uh, OK, call during, during the import. You can just call execute file of your already existing script. Yes, yes, I will. Thanks. <laughs> um, Test.twill. Ah, worse. OK. And we have our Twill assertion error, so we just can integrate in, in, in our unit test. Yeah? Ah, yeah, Selenium, uh, this compared to Selenium is like, uh, I don't know, uh, my scooter compared to a Ferrari. Uh, meaning that Twill is very, very simple and is quite updated. I think that the last, the last version is 2008. Uh, Selenium is uh, very powerful, but it's much more complicated. It, it has totally another model. It can simulate a browser, it can simulate a specific browser, say I'm Google Chrome, it, can work, it works with JavaScript and so on and so forth. But I decided not to cover it because we would need a, a, a separate training. In fact, there is or was, I, I can't remember, a training about test-driven development with Selenium. So if you uh, want to, to go deep with uh, web application testing, do use Selenium. Twill is a just like, a, 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 a quick nifty tool because we do we all we all do something web and this is a quick way to just assert that the pages are there and so on. Other questions? Again, the choice of, of what to show you was uh, it was a compromise between showing very cool things like Selenium and Time and and showing you everything. So uh, another thing that I absolutely want to show you, because it's um, not widely known of, is fuzz testing. Uh, if you have worked or know about engineering nowadays, you'll know that all the rage is about probabilistic design. Because you know the universe we live in is not as easy as, uh, you know, OK, this is the equation, and it will work exactly this way. There's chaos involved. Even in the atom, uh, we, we, we talk about probabilistic clouds because we don't know where the electron is at any given time. And this is true for macroscopic levels as well. So when you are designing cars, uh, house foundations, bridges, everything, you will lose uh, probabilistic methods. Uh, it's actually required by law, by law in Europe now, I think in the States as well. And there are a lot of methods. There is the well-known Monte Carlo methods. Uh, there are all methods to just uh, cope with chaos and insert random stuff into your equations that could happen for real because the world is random up to a point and see if everything works anyway. Um, and this is for uh, fields where you have quite a, a robust framework, which is physics. I know you don't expect bugs there, but there is chaos. So, is, uh, so it's actually very strange that in, in the field of software testing, of software in general, he doesn't like me to. Um, where we have a lot of more chaos because everyth everything was made by humans and everything can have bugs. Um, this concept is not widely, widely used uh, until about the 90s. Um, the okay, I'll try to talk a, a bit. Do you still hear me? 
So um, the idea is, is, is very, very simple and was used the first time in 1990 to test uh, the Unix system, uh, both GNU variants and uh, actual Unix, uh, and uh, just work it by randomly corrupting data and feeding the program with it. It seems like a simple idea, but when it was first tried, and five years later as well, it managed to crash about one-third of Unix, just, uh, you know, modifying some uh, uh, zero to ones in, in a configuration file, or it found a lot of crashes, and what, what, what's worse, it found a lot of buffer over. that of course are security problems. So uh, again, the idea is simple. Just randomly corrupt your input data and see what happens. Uh, which is like bring, bringing the same probabilistic approach we do have in engineering to software engineering. Uh, we do determinist testing we, because we tend to find different kind of stuff. But we can't stop the and uh, as I shown you, it fuzzing it has been used in the last 20 years to find dozens of bugs in, uh, especially in the file formats heavy uh, programs like Microsoft Excel, because when you have a file, uh, there are a lot of, of parts that can be corrupted and usually things can go very, very wrong. So uh, we will see a specific a specific fuzzing tool, which is not made in Python. There are Python fuzzing libraries, but I prefer to, to show you um, something external, because it can be used with everything, because when, when you, you do um, fuzzing, you're usually working with uh, network streams or file formats, protocols, so it's useful to know something that uh, you can use through your whole project, not only for the Python code. Uh, unfortunately, as I said at the beginning, uh, this tool doesn't work on Windows. So I would ask uh, you POSIX, POSIX people, either Mac OS or Linux, to adopt one Windows guy. There should be just a few of them and just work along uh, with... Uh, with uh, so if to, to see what happens. So if you're in Linux, uh, you should be able to just do, if you're using Ubuntu or Debian. This is the name of the tool. It's just the reverse of fuzz, Zaf. Uh, OK. Yes, but it's already installed, actually, here. If you're on uh, the Macintosh and uh, you have installed Brew, it's just brew install zuf, zuf, which is already installed. Yeah. OK, so what does uh, Zaf do? Oh. No. I think it's the mic. Maybe the battery is. I think. It's uh, thanks for the ice cream. Do you? Can you still hear me? Yeah. So um, what it does, as we have said, is to randomly corrupt data. Let's see uh, a simple example. I prepared a nice text file, which is silly ASCII art for hello. So if we do cat hello.txt, we get the original file. We want to fuzz it. It's very simple. That's why I, I love Zaf. Can you see? Some of the bytes have changed. And uh, as a result, oh, hello is messed. And we just used uh, uh, we just use everything default. We can specify, for example, we want to corrupt it more with the ratio dash r, which is the ratio parameter, uh, where one means 
100% of bytes of bits are modified. Uh, here we we can't uh, we can't even recognize the file, and we can try with different 10%. Still pretty unrecognizable. Just we just I think uh, maybe one or two bits. This is the def default. Uh, you'll notice something that is r it's random, but it goes the same way every time you you call it. It's, rep it's reproducible, which is very important because if you if you if you find a bug modify randomly modifying um, a protocol or a data file, you want to be able to. To see what 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 causes it, and uh, uh, I know the question is well if you if it works the same time every time uh, every time you launch it is not random, it is it's just it you can specify the so-called random seed the default is zero, and when you call on the same data on the with the same random seed and of course the same fuzzy ratio you will always get the same result. No matter of the machine uh, you're calling on, uh, you will always get the same result. And uh, but if you want, you can change the random seed, and you will get different. Okay. So you can have bought. Uh, actually, what you usually do is uh, let's try it with. 1,000 random seeds. Uh, there's a convenient. I will show you again. So, here, let's try the first thousand random seeds. Okay, it just fuzzes it in a different way, depending on the which is cool. And another thing uh, that we can notice is that we are not doing anything special to the file itself. We're just calling it because Zaf uh, intercepts the system calls of the applications. We can see it with the debug parameter. It intercepted the system call of the application and fuzzed the data before of returning it, which is why it doesn't work on Windows because you know on POSIX system the system calls are one way, on the Windows uh, systems are quite different. So. Uh, they would have to rewrite uh, everything from scratch, I think. And what's important is that doing this, um, the fuzzing is only dependent on data and on <coughs> the seed and the ratio, not on the application used. So you can use cut uh, or you can use uh, every other application. It only let's see it with mm, dev0. Dev0 is a special Unix file that is full of zeros, just a zero generator. So we have uh, xdump, which is called the HD, I think, on Linux. Let's just OK, we are reading just 32 bytes of zeros. Not very interesting. See, if you do this on your machine, you should have the same exact result. The same bytes were flipped. Uh, but the cool thing is the same data, the same fuzzing. So we can do this, for example. It doesn't matter who, who opens the file, it only depends on the data. Okay? Okay, so uh, I want to show you an example of how to use fuzzing to find a bug in a non deterministic way, which is very, very cool. Because the, the real cool thing about fuzzing is that it, it doesn't require much effort on your part. Yes, there are a, a few options, but mm, you don't have to actually write a lot of tests. You just launch it, and if, if, if there's some kind of bug, it will probably run. So I have prepared um, a rather complex example, maybe a bit more complex than the other ones I show you. 
okay, let's say we are contacted or hired by the National Security Agents to work on uh, some kind of menace that is in Florence in this period. The yellow shirts, you know, they never sleep. You know, they never tired. They have incredible stamina, not to mention patience, superhuman patience maybe. And there are le legion. Nobody knows how many yellow shirts are around. So they could be super villains, superheroes, aliens, uh, and they must be closely monitored. Of course, this is confidential and classified. So the NSA just put some specially designed sensor detectors all around Florence that will just recognize every yellow shirt which is passing by and increment a counter. They want to know how many are there. Uh, this is a description of the monitoring network. We have the sensor all about Florence and they send a ping to us, a monitoring station, every, thi every time they see one of them passing by. The monitoring station then sends a message with a, speci with a specific binary protocol, which is how usually hardware stuff work uh, because of, of computation constraints and space constraints, you don't use XML, you just use bytes and bits format in the same way, in some way. And uh, our job is to pass that parameter and just calculate the average between the number of active sensors at the given time and the number of yellow shells. So we have the average yellow shells per detector parameter, which is very useful. Trust me. So I just came up with a simple protocol. Uh, the boxes are bytes. We're just using STX with start transmission, A uh, ETX with, uh, which is end transmission, R2 characters in the ASCII set, which are actually used very, very often for this kind of, of things in binary protocols. You know, it's all, uh, it's a bit, big but you can see it here okay you always do that in binary protocols because you want to be sure uh, when the record starts when the record stops just some some kind of you know boundary of our message then we have one byte for the active number of detectors and two bytes of the number of shirts detected so this will be a binary message Let's see how to, to do this. I actually have al it already coded because I expected it would, would have a bit time. Okay. Uh, which is cool because it shows you a very nice, uh, I, I really love it, mm, uh, Python library of, this, of the batteries that helps you to work with binary stuff. Admittedly, it's not as common as a situation as it used to be a while ago, because now we have a XML, which is so easy to pass that, of course, we always pass XML. Uh, actually, it, can, it comes with a lot of headache, but of a different kind. But if you end up working with hardware, you'll use struct. Uh, with struct, you'll just uh, say, okay, you know, uh, in Python, uh, this is where you Python 3 guys will have a lot of trouble because we're working with string and bytes and uh, so here every everything is a string, in Python 3 should be bytes. Anyway, we use some kind of format string. I'll show you the documentation. You just use mm, those characters in the format string to describe how to how to, to to use the string. You know, if you have four bytes, how do you use them? Are they a single uh, long number of four bytes or four one byte numbers? So, okay, this this, this just describe our protocol. There is a character that is or STX. Let me show you the specification. Okay. Character, then a byte, which is a number, 
uh, a short, a two bytes long uh, number, and another character. And then we just call the, the directory, um, sorry, the struct model here. Pass message, okay, here. Okay, struct unpacked is very cool. It gets a, a stream of bytes, a string of bytes. Uh, using the format string, it just gives you a tuple of the values. Okay, so you have something that comes in a binary format and gives you in, a, in just in usual, usable Python data. Okay, it's not very important. I, I know this can be a bit uh, more complex than other things, but it's not really important how it works. Uh, it just does this uh, a bit of magic with bytes uh, to get the numbers that are encoding binary, then we return uh, what we want to know, the average. Here we are multiplying by a float because of the thing we, we have seen in the very beginning. Uh, I have already prepared a message that uh, in a binary format, which is uh, which is not very very cool to look at because it, it has a printable character, but it has encoded a number of shirts and a number of sensors. So let's call with uh, sorry. Okay, everything is cool. It works. Does it really work? we will start trying to fuzz that file, corrupting its bytes, and see what happens. If we, if we make uh, just a test case with these values, it will work. Okay, we'll do it in Linux because there's an annoying bug on, uh, on OS X with Python. It just can't directly, directly mm, intercept the system calls because of the way uh, Python for is compiled on the Mac. But we, we could just use cut. Actually, we can use cut here. Oh, uh, here it will be. OK, so it I, I made it so it works uh, with standard input as well. So this, OK, malformed message because it has a protection. Uh, if th it doesn't start with that uh, STX byte and doesn't end, okay, it's a malformed message, so it won't work. But, of course, okay, it's, it's just the same that calling it directly with the file. Just a workaround for a ZAF bug. So, we could start doing this. See, it has corrupted the file. It has corrupted the file where the bytes, where the numbers were defined. Uh, it didn't crash our application, but we can try doing with. Uh, more. We are just cycling through different seeds. Okay, this is annoying, malformed message, okay. We already tested that behavior. We know it can understand what the message is, is wrong. So uh, this is actually annoying here because uh, we lose a lot of time testing something. We already know it works. Uh, Zaf is very cool. Uh, you can either say to you want to protect a couple of bytes. This is actually some something that you'll use a lot because if you want, for example, to fuzz um, a network input, import you you want uh, want, for example, to corrupt HTTP headers because nothing will wo will, will work. So uh, you can say, okay, let's save the header and only change the content here. Our header is the part that we don't know to change is the bytes 0 and 4. 
and we want only two fast byte one, two, and three. Okay, still nothing. Let's try iterating a bit more and see what happens. Oh, what happened? Zero division error? Right, of course, because if the number <laughs> of detectors and any given name is zero, uh, th this will be a division by zero. Admittedly, we should have made um, a test, a unit test to test this, because this is the classic boundary condition. But what I think is cool I is that we found this bug, uh, so to say, by chance, just f randomly corrupting data, and it kept corrupting stuff uh, till it corrupted that it was to zero and uh, we just found a bug for free. Sorry if the example was a bit contrived maybe but uh, we, we needed a file a file a file format and all but what what's really cool is that um, Zafis can do an anything um, in very transparent way if you specify for instance dash n it will uh, fuzz your network import, uh, your network uh, operations. You can uh, specify which ports, which destination ports. You can exclude specific ports. You can exclude specific protocols. You can uh, just fuzz a specific, for example, if you have an uh, application that uses a configuration file and you don't want it to be fuzzed, you can exclude. It's very, very cool. And as you have seen, it finds bugs for free. So, um, what's cool about fast testing is it has a very high cost-benefit ratio. You just have to, to stay there for a couple of minutes and figure out the right option for your case and just launch it and uh, with a wide range of, of either ratios or seeds and if it will probably find some bugs. And what What's cool about fuzzing is that it usually finds different kind of bugs from unit testing. So that means you can't just keep unit testing and just fuzz trying to randomly catch everything. You can do both. It's very good for security and for file formats and I think a lot of zero, zero uh, zero-day security bugs nowadays, I think the vast majority gets found with this kind of techniques. Just feeding random, uh, corrupt, uh, corrupting randomly protocols and uh, some things came up. Maybe is there an application of this approach with uh, uh, a file where you have uh, a specific format? I mean, uh, yeah. for instance, uh, when you want to change the an HTML file, which is the input of your code, yeah, but you so want you the 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 modification to keep the file consistent with the, the HTML. Of course, it would be a bit. Uh, it would be a bit hard to do with Zaf because Zaf really works at a very low level. But you can protect bi specific bytes, and you can just, for example, you can say only accept printable characters. I don't want non-printable characters to be generated. You have a very fi fine-grained control on what Zaf generates and where in your file format. But for HTML, it could be very, very tiresome because you're here you're working with bits, and in HTML you're working with much higher level structures. But for example, if you, uh, it works very well with uh, file formats. They found a lot of bugs in Microsoft Excel, and in numeric as well. Just random stuff because when you have to support 10 years, 20 years worth of binary file formats of complicated file format. Uh, you will never know what some user can, can come up with. 
uh, wear bugs, with bugs, oftentimes it's very difficult to send someone, could you send me your 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 Excel file because it could have you know sens sensitive data. So I wouldn't use it probably for HTML. I would use some more specific. But for file formats and protocol, this is great. The yellow shirt conspires. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Regia mi senti adesso? Ti sentiamo anche noi però. And can you uh, talk about a similar type of testing called mutant testing? You mean using this with unit testing? No, mutant testing. Oh okay. I I, I sh actually I wouldn't I wouldn't want to go very deep about the the various kind of fast testing, multi-testing, with, with or without semantics. Mm -hmm. What I can add is that uh, the CERT is using a FAS as uh, the base for their uh, BFF, which is basic fuzzing uh, framework. And they first tried using a lot of options, a lot of semantics, but uh, they, in the end, they just resorted to fuzzing everything, not even protecting the format because it's they tended to find much more bugs with a brute force approach because you know the cost is so s low here mm. to just throw everything and uh, just see what seeds cause it that uh, of course there are a lot of options but uh, there are a lot of tools Fuzz, Zaf is only one I just wanted you to um, to put this kind of approach in your radar because it's very very useful and uh, just uh, other questions on fuzzing or anything else? I just wanted to clarify something that I said. I said that Zaf is very useful for black box testing, uh, which is just another piece of software testing lexicon. If you consider your system as a black box, of course you can't see the internals. You don't know what's there, so you can your test your test can only work on maybe its API. Zaf usually is a kind of black box testing because when we, 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 we tried testing our binary protocol coded in Python, we didn't know from there about methods, about the struct module, about classes. We just worked on the boundaries of so we, in this case we, we talk about black box testing because the system internals are invisible for us. On the other end, white box testing or transparent box testing is when you do know about your system internals, for instance, where you're doing your doc test and you're calling the functions directly, of course you know how they're implementing and how they should be called, so your test can mm, just go inside. Just a bit of jargon that can be useful to know. So uh, we have maybe five minutes, something like that. 12 minutes. Okay, I'll show you a last thing, I promise, which is very easy. Um, again, in during th this training, I tried to show you a lot of stuff, different approaches, different tools. I know we didn't go in depth with something. We, we could just do four hours just of unit testing and mocker, but I think uh, it would have been useful to give you a landscape as I said. So I'll just tell you about um, a kind of testing that is much less used in Python than for example C or other static compiled language which is uh, static checking of code. You know in C this is a, a huge part of, of software testing. It's the compilers try to, 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 to figure out in advance if you're doing something weird with memory allocation and so on and so forth. With Python it's very very difficult because it's so dynamic it's not very easy for a software to tell if or, or script is, uh, is, is correct. But nevertheless there are a couple of tools that do help a little bit. The first one is called PEP8 which of course you can install with sudo 
Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Pip install pep8. Pep8 is, of course, related to the actual pep8. Peps are Python announcement proposals, which con are formal documents uh, of the Python language. The pep8 uh, contains uh, coding styles guide. So, like, you should have two blank lines uh, between uh, the first, the last import and the first function, and so on and so forth. Uh, PEP8 just uh, makes sure that we are respecting those rules. It's very easy to use. Oh. You can see uh, uh, it gives you code, uh, error codes. And the most used code here is this one because I use tabs to indent. And Yes, it's a warning, but a warning. Uh, and we can, there are way, uh, yes, I think ignore. Uh, since not, I can't remember as, as usual, dash dash ignore, of course, is a long option. Um, Okay, much better. You can even uh, write a configuration file if you, like me, use tabs, or you can say, for example, uh, okay, we are in 2013, my lines will be 200 characters long, and so on and so forth. It's a nifty little tool, and you can config configure it mm, to some extent. Another tool which goes a bit deeper with your program is PyLint. Okay, PyLint will, oh, that's not a good rating. <laughs> I've done worse. Uh, <laughs> I can assure you. So it, it, it says you everything PEP8 does, and it says a lot more, like duplicate lines, and uh, things like unused imports, uh, things like undefined names, uh, so like you forget to import time and you do time dot time, and every every little bit that is possible to statically check in Python, PyLint will. So my suggestion sh is to use it on your code now and then. Maybe you sh can have some automated way of launching it of your repository. Uh, for example, a subversion or mercurial hook. It's not as useful as in, in Python as it is in C, but uh, it's still useful at times that it's almost free. Okay. Mm. I think we only have a few minutes. Uh, of course, I... I didn't make it to, to show you all the material I had, but I expected it. Uh, I prefer to the things I did tell you to be very clear. I did a lot of mistakes o of on my own that actually that's good because it shows uh, you can't, you can never be sure uh, that you won't do uh, mistakes just because you're good, just because you uh, have a lot of experience, just because you know your libraries, because you will, will be tired, you will be unfocused. Uh, and I, I think, I don't think I need to tell you this because maybe 10 years ago, uh, some programmer would think they were too good for testing. Maybe they wouldn't tell, but mm, I think a lot of people still thought it. Nowadays, I don't, I don't think, I think the situation is changing and seeing 12 talks being voted for, <coughs> about testing by voting for EuroPython 2013, which is, I think, unprecedented. I think in the first EuroPython I was at, which was EuroPython 2003, we had zero. 
but we had the whole track about Zoe. Maybe it's testing is bad. And anyway, I think the situation is changing, and uh, I do hope, with my limited exposition of a lot of stuff, to help you, to, to, to persuade you, first of all, that testing is useful, that you should do it because it's convenient, because it can be fun, it can help you even in the development phase, and I hope you, I gave you a good landscape of tools and approaches you can now, of course, go and uh, study you by yourself in some more depth or just attend to some other training. Of course, I will be very happy to answer to more specific questions or to talk about uh, stuff like jazz, for instance. <laughs> I'll be around uh, uh, either at the Pi Academy booth or around here till Friday, so I will be very, very happy if you have questions. Just some running suggestions. The first one, beautiful testing, is um, is very nice because it, it it's about a high level approach. It's the book that made me started with fuzzing, for example. It has it's it's very focused on the process itself, so how to write a test case even for big projects, and it has wonderful wonderful chapters like the one a chapter about how to test a random number generators, which is which is very tricky because how to test something that is supposed in order to work to be random, well. The the answer is you do sta you use a, use a lot of statistics to do it, but it's just a chapter. There's a whole chapter about how Python code is tested, for example. It's a very, very, very high-level good book. Uh, the middle one is the is on the opposite side. It's a very um, very handsome guide. This sort of follows what I have said here today, except maybe fuzzing maybe the other way around because I got a lot of suggestions for example about Twill because I use Selenium but of course in more depth it's a good book where to start uh, about and the third one is about the unit test uh, library in every possible implementation C++, six unit actually it's quite a boring book in my opinion but it's very if you if you want to and it's a bit dated but I just included it because it's a classic and so I want to thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. I, as I said, I, you, you, you can, if you liked it, you can tweet about it. You can write me an email and you can rate it on, rate it on the guidebook if you have suggestions uh, or want to talk about everything. I'll be around or you can just write me by email. Um, now, if in the, in the last minutes, if you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you then, and have fun testing and programming. Thank you.